Um, so a massive welcome uh, to the Belgrave tonight. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time to, and coming tonight. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through the format of the evening before we start. Um, so this is a single panel. Um, we've got five fantastic panellists. Um, and we're just going to run straight through. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. Uh, and we're going to also ask some questions that we've got uh, beforehand. Um, and it's just going to be no break, uh, one panel. Um, and there will be a chance for a social after. Um, so if anyone uh, wants to hang around, have a drink, um, you're more than welcome to. Some of the pan panelists may be hanging around for a drink too, so you can probably ask them more questions if you want to at that point. Uh, we are using a service called Slido um, for the questions tonight. Um, so if you just go to sli.do and enter sdh19, that'll allow you to ask questions. Um, you can anonymous, anonymous, anonymously Thank you. <laughs> ask questions. Um, if you, if you want. Um, so, uh, my name is Josh Nesbitt, and uh, along with Rose Montague, uh, we're going to be ho your hosts for this evening. Um, I run Hey, uh, Rose, along with some other people, run uh, She Does Digital. Uh, hey is a platform for you to um, talk about anything you're passionate about. So, uh, we run three, uh, three-ish events a year, along with a conference um, called All Day Hey at Everyman Cinema. Uh, and you can talk about anything. So, we welcome people to talk about software development, uh, mental health, uh, right down to the art of, uh, the art of coffee. Um, so I'm just going to let Rose say a few words about um, She Does Digital and then we'll get started. Cool. So yeah, so thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, so yes, I'm Rose and I head up She Does Digital. Um, so for those of you who have never been to any of our events before, um, we are a group of volunteers who work across the digital industry in Leeds. And our primary goal is really to try and encourage more women um, into the digital industry because quite frankly, there's, there's not that many of us. Um, and according to Tech Nation, um, there's only 19% um, of the UK's digital work workforce that are female. So the work that we do as She Does Digital aims to really try and change that. Um, we aim to break down the barriers um, and make the di digital industry accessible for all. Uh, we do this by educating people about the digital in industry and the different roles that are on offer. Um, and also by show showcasing uh, digital role models and working um, that work, sorry, across uh, digital businesses across Leeds. Um, we collaborate and partner uh, with schools, colleges, universities, businesses and other groups such as Hey, um, to run workshops, campaigns um, and host events. So if anyone um, or has any projects that they know of um, that you'd like our help with or, um, or if you'd like to get involved in our cause, then please come and chat to me afterwards. It'd be great to have a little chat. Um, so on to tonight. Um, so tonight's event is really about showcasing career changes. Um, so talking to people who have done a 360 on their careers um, and ended up in digital. Um, the main aim of tonight is really to highlight that you don't necessarily need to have um, a background in digital to get into the industry um, and that skills gained in other careers um, are really relevant and transferable. Um, the idea for tonight's theme came from our um, audience members really, so from previous events um, we end up chatting to our audience members and a lot of them are in a situation where they are looking to get into digital um, but they're not sure how. Um, so we thought why not better than to try and find some role models who can really talk us through their experiences and inspire us and kind of tell us how they did it really. So I'm going to basically hand over to our panel of speakers um, but like Josh said before, if you guys have got any questions, um, it'd be great for you to kind of get involved in the conversation after. Um, so we'll hand over to Jem, and she'll tell you a little bit more about her story into digital. Hello, everyone. Hi, I am uh, Jem Henderson. Um, my current role is um, a entrepreneur engagement manager for Tech Nation. Um, so there's two parts to my job. Tech Nation run a series of programs for founders, ranging from people that have just got an idea right up to future 50 businesses who include people like Monzo Bank. Um, so I find founders across Leeds and across Yorkshire to get onto our, onto our programs. So that's kind of like the main bit of my job, but the soup of it and the bit which is actually really fascinating is what I like to call digital gossip. So it's my job to go out across Yorkshire to talk to everybody in the tech ecosystem just to find out who's doing what, which means that when somebody comes to me and says, do you know anybody that can help me with this? I can go, aha, I do. I've just spoken to this person, they're doing this thing. Um, but the way I got here is uh, 
kind of bonkers, to be honest. So uh, at 16 years old, I was kicked out of home. Um, I lived in a squat in Harrogate, and I lived in a homeless hostel. Um, and I needed a job. So I was, I'd been cooking at home since I was nine years old. So I became, well, actually, I started out by becoming a kitchen porter. Um, but after about six months of doing that, I ended up being a grill chef. Um, I did that for a couple of years, um, which was kind of interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite a good cook now, which is good. Um, it's helpful. I managed to wean my little four-year-old boy on curry, so I must be doing something right. Um, I didn't really like kitchen work after a while, particularly because it's really awful in the summertime, and basically all chefs are alcoholics. I'm sorry if you're a chef. Um, and um, I then, I think I did an, uh, I was an apprentice hairdresser for a bit. I was an apprentice painter and decorator. So, you know, if you ever need any wallpaper putting up, I am your girl. Um, and then unfortunately, I had a bit of a mental health breakdown and I ended up getting signed off sick. Um, I was actually off sick for six years, um, which was challenging. However, in that time, I managed to do three degrees. Um, I did a foundation art degree, I did an English literature degree, and I finished up by doing a master's in creative writing with a specialism in Haruki Murakami and Japanese literature. So, finished that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm all right at this writing malarkey. And I thought, well, what, what do I do with this, really? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think I can take Japanese literature anywhere, really. Um, so. Uh, taking my love of Star Trek, I thought, do you know what? Maybe I could write about tech. So thankfully, I uh, managed to land myself a role as a tech copywriter um, two weeks after I handed in my master's dissertation. Um, did that for six months, got made redundant, unfortunately, and then felt like, to be honest, the workload I was being given at work meant I was finishing everything by Tuesday lunchtime. So I decided to set up my own copywriting business. Um, I set, set that up um, while I was working at Parallax one day a week um, and I ran that successfully for six years. I went from kind of writing for a content farm doing £10 articles about casinos and holidays that I hadn't really taken. Um, I then uh, had three weeks off when I had my little boy because you can't take time off when you've got a business um, and thankfully when I was 30 six weeks pregnant, I'd gone for an interview with a lady called Caroline Gorski, and she was the head of the Internet of Things at Telefonica, and she got me a job writing for her um, on everything from AI to blockchain to the Internet of Things, and I absolutely loved that. Um, I did that for a few months for her, and then when she got a role at Digital Catapult as the head of IoT, she invited me along to become the community manager, so I started um, I started doing that com community manager role, which is doing social media, etc. But we were a very small team, we were only five people, so I ended up basically doing all of the marketing for the IoT UK program at Digital Catapult. Um, I ended up leading a project which was run out of Leeds with ODI and Bloom, which was a data science project, um, mapping the ecosystem and the IoT ecosystem across the UK. And from there, um, managed to, oh wait, no, then, <laughs> then I really loved my, uh, my work in tech and I really wanted to do something for my hometown of Harrogate. So I then set up a tech and digital hub uh, called IndieWorks Collective in, in Harrogate. Uh, unfortunately, for various reasons, that didn't quite work out, but I had met Kane Fulton, who did my job previously at Tech Nation, and when his role came became available, I went, hang on a minute, that's essentially what I... This is, this is the perfect job for me. It's social media, it's meeting people, it's building ecosystems. So I applied for the job. Five minutes into my interview, I told the chap that was interviewing me, Mike Jackson, you know I am perfect for this job, right? And he went, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, started that. I've been doing it for eight months now. And frankly, it's one of the best jobs I've ever had. Um, it's going out, talking to folks. And yeah, I really love it. And that's it, really. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jack? Hello everyone, good evening. Um, my name is Jack, I work as an account director at Parallax, which is a digital agency down on the calls. Um, I have worked there for about six and a half years, um, but 
how I sort of got into all of that is uh, my band got signed to Mercury uh, when I was 17. Um, so that was a bit of a crazy whirlwind. I ended up ditching college fairly early doors, just quietly sort of left. Um, we joined Mercury, released uh, three albums, um, got a single in the top 10, album in the top 10, um, toured all over, uh, did brand collaborations with uh, Burberry and Coca-Cola, um, and yeah, just spent a lot of time creating music. Um, I'm a synth player, so I was always quite interested in tech and twiddling around with things and making th playing around with electronics, basically. Um, and digital was always the other thing that I really loved. Um, when I was at college, for the brief time that I was there, I made friends with uh, a few of the guys that eventually came to start Parallax. Um, and sort of, whenever I was at home, I was always sort of keeping an eye on what they were doing, trying to sort of, you know, learn about what they were creating. I'd never heard of like a, a digital agency before, but I, I liked the idea of working with brands from what I'd seen from working with Burberry and Coke. And you get a bit of a taste for what it's like to put these things out and, and be in that sort of sphere. And that sort of combined with the sort of thirst that I had for that tech side of things, I did start to get more and more interested in what Parallax were doing. And uh, as time went on and the band started to settle down a little bit, they sort of said, all right, well, you've got a, you are, you are quite obsessive over detail, which I am, for, that's a failing of mine, I understand. Um, they said, why don't you come in and test some websites for us? Um, you'll, you'll pick up the details, you'll know if something doesn't look right. And I was like, I don't, I don't actually know I don't actually know if it's wrong or not, though. And they're like, well, you do. You know, if you know, you know what it, you expect it to do, and if it doesn't do that, then it's not right. That's, the, that's all you need to know to start with. So I got in, got going with that, and started to learn a bit about how websites and apps are put together. Um, and the more I learned about that, the more I ended up talking to clients um, and explaining to them how things worked in that sort of non-techy way, sort of like humanizing the tech side of things, I suppose. Um, and that sort of just kept on rolling along and I started to be more and more client-facing, got into a project management role and then an account manager and then I've become an account director now. Um, and yeah, I think it's that sort of active interest in taking things to bits and seeing how they work and what happens if I press that and oops, should, probably shouldn't have pressed that one, but never mind, we won't do that one again. Um, that sort of learn by doing thing has is, is sort of got me where I am. And I think, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a good time. They keep letting me in, so I must be doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Uh, Leanne? Hi, um, I'm a software developer at NHS Digital on the Graduate Scheme. Um, I'm also really into cybersecurity, which is my main passion. So if you want to grab me about any cybersecurity related things, do do so. I'd love that. Um, so I'd like to say that I got into tech via the scenic route, and I really wish I would have asked for directions a bit sooner. So um, the way I got into tech is I did a, a degree in English literature many, many years ago. Um, set up my own business with my husband, a wedding photography business, which is still going today. Um, and what I was finding, though, is um, a lot of the other jobs I was doing um, while running my business was uh, a lot of project management work. So um, one of the roles that I particularly loved was one I actually got made redundant from. And it all happened over Christmas, and it was a really stressful time. Um, and what it was was I was a project lead for a crisis charity dealing with people who were facing severe destitution, so homelessness, no money to feed themselves, um, and any sort of, sort of crisis in life, so anything really awful that can happen in life, people came into our service and we tried to make it better for them. And what I was finding, um, what people were, the main barriers to people being in destitution was, was access to digital services. Um, and while I was working at the time, I was doing my master's in anthropology via distance learning, um, and anthropology, for those who don't know, it's the study of um, human cultures and how society is made up and how we engage with each other. Um, and I started to do a sort of digital slant on that while I was working because my work was informing my masters. And I was coming across a theory called the digital divide, which posits that 
um, people who don't have access to services online, it's to their detriment and they actually end up being worse off in society. And that's exactly what I was finding. So people were coming into our services and you know they couldn't access the benefits because the benefit system it geared itself to be all online. Um, you know, couldn't access housing. There was, was means to do it offline, but if you wanted the nice stuff, you had to get online and do it first. Jobs are all online. So uh, I was really trying to find ways to sort of tackle these barriers. And, you know, there were lots of reasons why people couldn't access these services. You know, financial being the main thing, you know, it costs money to actually run a smartphone and a laptop and, you know, broadband. Um, low digital literacy, you know, they'd never used a computer before in their life. A lot of our clients as well had um, low literacy levels in general anyways. So, you know, just the idea of even being able to access services like that was a big no-no. Um, and also a lot of um, anxiety and mental health issues that would prevent them, for example, because the argument we got a lot from uh, the job centre was like, oh, well, they, people can just go to the library and access a computer for free. These people who were in the worst moments in their lives do not want to go to a library and ask people to show them how to use a computer. So that's the sort of work I was doing in that. And it really, really informed everything I was doing in terms of um, really trying to hone in to the wider stakeholders, so like the council, um, wider government, and sort of say, actually, this digital divide is a real problem, and it's a real problem in Leeds. As I say, I absolutely loved that job. It was really um, challenging, um, emotionally draining, but every day was different, and it was really great to feel like I was making a difference. I probably would have still been there today if I hadn't been made redundant, because I really did love that job. Um, but as it is with the third sector, you know, budget cuts and things like that. Um, so I got made redundant three days before Christmas, which is a real sting. Um, but prior to that, um, I, I knew it was coming, you know, the redundancy process. So I'd been looking about what do I want to do going forward? Um, so I started looking online. I thought, well, I really enjoy the digital aspect of my master's. Where can I take that further? Can I do any tech good anywhere? Um, so I went to Sky's Get Into Tech Day, which is a fantastic um, thing that they run where um, they encourage women to get into tech and they teach them how to code. And by the end of it, you might have a job. So that really appealed to me. Um, so I went to their tech day. It was fantastic. We did some pseudo coding exercises. Um, they did talks on why we need to get more women into the tech industry. Um, and I was sold. You know, the offices were fantastic as well. Third sector does not look like Sky's offices. Um, so I waited and waited, checked my emails constantly, thinking, oh, I hope I get this. I, hope, I really hope I get this. And then I get the email. and. Oh, thanks for coming. We regret. So unfortunately, they're lost. Uh, but I didn't uh, get in. Um, but I thought I still am really interested, and I really liked the actual coding aspect that we did on the day. So I decided to treat coding, learning, teaching, learning myself how to code, like a full-time job while I was looking for uh, a job in between. So I spent like every single waking hour doing it. I neglected all my family, all my friends. Um, spent my life on free code camp, code academy, um, and it was really fun until it wasn't fun anymore because it started getting really difficult. Um, and that's when I sort of looked um, wider to the tech community and I was looking for my own tech tribe to kind of keep me going. Uh, and that's where I found like wonderful organizations like She Does Digital and Code Up Leads and Ladies of Code. And it was so great for me to go to these events and hear other women and just other people just saying, yep, yeah, I've been there. It is, you know, it does get difficult, but it gets better. You will get it. You know, um, especially when, because I was a career changer, and you know, I was like, oh, am I doing the right thing? You know, I've got a mortgage. You know, do you know, I've got a family to think of. I'm retraining in my thirties. You know, is that the right thing to do? And I'm, I don't have a computer science degree. You know, um, is that the right thing? And just being around people um, who were there to support me were really, really great. Um, and that gave me the impetus to sort of think, okay, I am job ready now, I'm going to start applying for jobs. So I applied for a job at uh, NHS Digital on their graduate training scheme. Um, and it was a really highlight for me because going through the interview process, I had to explain like, why do I deserve to even be there? And I got to explain about all the sort of hard work I'd been putting in, you know, all the conferences and events I'd been doing and how I really sort of embodied the whole tech life, you know, within it was literally about four months um, from my um, first learning how to code to going to my first interview. Um, so I really pushed for it. Um, and it's just been fantastic. And they, they, they obviously liked what they saw because they accepted me on it. Um, and what I would say to people coming into thinking about, you know, should I do a Korean tech, you know, and want to do a technical role, I was like, just go for it. 
you know, the technical side can be taught, you know, you, if you just take the time and learn it. And it's afforded me such fantastic opportunities. So at NHS Digital, I've um, been able to organize a code club for internal staff members, so people who are non-technical can learn how to code. Um, it's allowed me to come and do events like this, lots of public speaking. I've been a mentor to quite a few women already. Um, you know, people have asked if um, they can finance my ideas. Um, and lots of, I've done lots of activism work as well that I've really been enjoying. And the best thing about it for me is that it's all just starting. So if this is what I can do at the start of my career, you know, now I'm now 20 months in, just think of the opportunities that can arise. Cool, thank you, Leanne. And Lucy. Hi, uh, I'm Lucy and I work as a digital content creator. So that basically means that I make cool looking stuff for Instagram. And um, mine isn't so much as a career path change, but just a general path change. So I took my first step into adulthood by studying French and Hispanic studies at King's College London. And I think I lasted about three months until I decided I really hated French politics and didn't want anything to do with that. Um, and so I decided to stay in London, but actually leave the university and just worked in a couple of bars, not really knowing what to do. And then I started writing for an online music magazine, um, just writing like reviews of albums and some shows and stuff. It was unpaid, but it just meant that I got to like listen to albums early and go to shows for free, so it was fun. And all of a sudden I decided it wasn't like university in general that I hated, but rather that specific course and that specific university, so. It was actually the UCAS deadline day when I decided to reapply and I had to call up my French tutor from college and get her to write me this, well, break her heart at first as well by telling her I wasn't doing French anymore and then write this whole new statement. This time I just decided journalism because of this newfound love for writing I had. So um, I started at Leeds University in um, the following year studying journalism. Uh, I didn't, I loved London as a city, but I decided to go for more of a campus approach. And honestly, I really just chose Leeds because I was too deep in my relationship to, and I just wanted to come home. And um, it, was, it was like a good year. I liked the course, but I didn't want to be a journalist either. But I made use of the fact that we could rent out free camera equipment in the department and um, actually got really, really into photography by just having a go, really. And um, I started just doing, pretty much just taking photos of my friends and just doing whatever and building this kind of like portfolio thing. And when it came to the end of my first year, I wanted to work full time over the summer. So I reached out to sort of a handful of digital and creative agencies here in Leeds really just looking for an internship or anything. And this one agency called Vast um, had, had just had someone leave, so they had this opening, and I went for it. And um, well, actually, I just went for this meeting with them, and then they ended up just offering me this job, which was as a um, studio photographer. At this point, I'd really not even taken photos of anyone other than my friends, but it was, so I was really just thrown in the deep end. And we were quite a small agency, worked mo mostly with like menswear fashion clients. So we had a small studio upstairs and I would shoot like flat lay and product shots and sort of like the kind of content that you would see in like an email blast or some kind of social media stuff sometimes. And I learned everything from studio lighting and batch editing to just like how the industry works and how to behave in this kind of environment. And I loved that job so much. I actually, I was about 19, 20 at this point. I had one of the photos I took was in the storefront of the Ben Sherman flagship store in Carnaby Street, which was like, all of this happening, it just felt so right. I just loved it so much. So that was going really well. And I ended up persuading school to let me switch courses again. 
to um, film photography and media. So then it felt like everything was sort of coming together. I was going down this path. And I got involved with the Leeds Rag Fashion Show, which is a charity fashion show as part of my university uh, where I was the creative director. So I h headed up all content for promotional um, purposes as well as like documenting on the day and headshots and everything. And along with my job at Vast and this, I'd built this like really great portfolio and I was building like an Instagram account of my photography. So at that point, I then got recruited via Instagram DM to work for Blue Rins, which are a um, vintage store here in Leeds and Manchester and online and in Topshop too. So for them, I was like studio photographer again. So I did a lot of the e-commerce shots and everything, but also started working with more like the social media content. And um, I had so much more creative freedom there and it was, it was so much, so much fun because I could just hire my friends, like makeup artists and stylists, and build a team. One time, we just drove to Manchester and did this shoot, and I just loved everything about like being on set and being in a team and creating something that other people would look at. But I was also just getting bored of these small projects in Leeds and everything else. So at this point, I was. Um, living with my ex-boyfriend and he had an opportunity to, to tour the United States over the summer. So uh, secretly I was like, okay, well, I mean, I could do something in America in the summer too. And I reached out to maybe 15 to 20 brands and um, agencies in New York. And it, it was a couple of weeks later, it was always the eve of my 21st birthday when I had my interview with an agency called Sideways, who two weeks later sent me an offer letter for a three-month summer internship in Manhattan, working um, as a um, in this kind of vague uh, internship in photo and video. And it was honestly just mind-blowing. And of course, um, at this point, the news also came that my ex-boyfriend's opportunity had fallen through. So. I had to make that choice, and we know which one I made. I was straight out on that plane. <laughs> so, um, and then um, <laughs> it was like, um, yeah, this three months of internship. Uh, but honestly, it took about three weeks before I decided that three months was not long enough. And I s spoke with the relevant people, visa, still at uni at this point, and um, and with my job who you know, loved what I did. So I extended it into a whole year and I recently returned from my, from my year in New York working where my, my internship in photos and videos turned into this really legitimate full-time role in digital content creation. So my main responsibilities were I managed Instagram accounts for a couple of luxury hotels and I would sort of like hop around with my camera shooting little videos and photos and then you know publishing them and writing the captions and everything for their Instagram too and I, the the hotel part of it was it was cool because the perks you know they like flew me to Miami and stuff that was fun but it was it was also just like mm, you know I'd rather be in fashion so it came to the end of my trip and uh, well, the end of my like visa, basically, and I had to come home for uni, and this is why I'm here, even though you can tell I'm not happy about it. So, um, but before I was leaving New York, I went on this month-long trip in California where I was just like, spent a couple of weeks in LA, like exchanging content for free hotels and stuff, and then I had a job interview for. Um, uh, basically art director of social content for Dolls Kill, this alternative fashion brand based in San Francisco. And this job was everything I, I'd ever wanted. And I, I went for it and it was all going so well, but I made the very difficult decision to come home and complete my degree. <laughs> so 
that's where I am now. I work. <laughs> I'm really happy. <laughs> no, I am. Um, <laughs> I w no, I'm, I'm working freelance right now as in social content, and I'm working um, specifically with a record label based in London. I'm going to be going down to do some um, full time work with them soon too, um, and just finishing my degree so I can get back to doing what I love, basically. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and last up, we've got Maddie. Hi, everyone. Oh. I just want to start by saying I'm not as miserable as that photo makes out on there. Um, I'm Maddie. I am head of project management at Epiphany, um, which is a digital agency in Leeds based down in the dock. Um, mine is not so much a career change. Well, I guess it kind of is, but I never actually worked as a midwife because I spent my whole childhood thinking that's what I was going to do. I went to the relevant courses at college. I was like, great, I got like the top mark I could get in my course, applied for uni, super confident, five rejections, not even a single interview. I was like, what? Anyway, it turns out it's super competitive to get into midwifery and I'm totally over it. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so then I was a bit like, oh, don't really know what I'm going to do with myself. I'll just take a gap year because what else do you do, right? Um, I mean, a few weeks into that, I kind of realised that uh, spending every night in the pub is, is not really a gap year. So um, I thought, better get a job, you know, better do something. So I, on a whim, applied for a digital internship at a car insurance company um, named Covea. They are a sister of Swinton Insurance, if you've heard of them. Um, and it was digital marketing, and I literally was like, well, I'm going to apply for it. I have no idea what digital marketing is, but like... Pff, it's an internship, how hard can it be? Um, spent the night before Googling what is digital marketing. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> There's really <laughs> a lot of information out there. It's very hard to digest. And turns out digital is quite big. Anyway, I thought, well, we'll go for it anyway. Um, so I went to the interview. I actually wore my... Um, mum's dress because I didn't have any formal clothing at this point. I was uh, still practically a child. And um, got the job. Uh, it was six week internship that I started. Um, I remember on day one, I really was completely baffled as to what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. Um, and actually settled in really well. I think by the end of the first week, they'd offered me um, a full time job. I still didn't really know what I was doing there, but um, it was a job and I was on a gap year and that's what you do. So here I was taking the job. Um, I quite quickly started working on a new website offering that the company was doing. So basically they are an underwriter and they were creating a direct arm of the business. Um, so it was a, a website but it had a quote journey, a buy journey and we were working with an agency in Leeds um, to deliver that. So I was, and now that I work at an agency and realise, I think I was um, doing quite a a job considering I was the intern anyway I was kind of the main contact with the agency and putting together all the technical specs and working out what we needed to do um, still I mean didn't say this at the time didn't really know what I was doing but it seemed to be getting signed off and we were getting somewhere um, after working with the agency for quite a while and I know this is potentially a bit immature but when I remember coming to their, their offices at first I was like wow these offices are so cool like all the rooms are different themed and I was like you know what I need to work in an agency that's what I need to do that is obviously if you want to work in digital that's what you do so I stayed at Covea for two years um, and then decided that I needed to leave I wanted to go to, to a city it was between Leeds and Manchester I chose Leeds in the end um, and I got a job as an account executive in a different Leeds agency to where I am now um, to be honest, it didn't really work out there. Um, I enjoyed it, but I was quite bored with the work that I was being given and just didn't work out. So I left there after a year and did a bit of traveling. Um, whilst I was there, so because I was working in client services, I did um, kind of all aspects of digital, so SEO, PPC, web development, but kind of where my skill set really, really was and what I enjoyed doing was the web development side of it. So when I got back from travelling, I decided I want to work in project management and do web development. So um, again, even though I'd had two jobs in digital, I still had that whole self-doubt thing. I was like, oh my god, like pff, I don't have any experience. I don't know how I'm going to get this. And I just put a post out on LinkedIn. Anyone got any junior project manager jobs going? Um, bit about me. I can't really remember. Anyway, and that was when someone at Epiphany approached me and said, oh, we may have jobs going. Uh, are you interested? And that's why I met the lovely Annie, who is here. 
Um, and I think we had, I had the first interview in about 24 hours and I started the Monday. I'd come back from traveling, so um, the quicker the better for me. Um, started at Epiphany as a junior project manager, um, working in the project management team, so there was a few of us. Um, mainly working on web development stuff, but on some creative stuff as well. Um, I also then started doing a bit of project management for um, J-Wing, who are the agency that own us. Um, from there, I was promoted to project manager, um, and I am now head of the project management team. So um, it's worked out all well, all right. Um, I know a bit more about digital now than I did the night before my first interview, um, but I'm still, I'm still learning every day. So yeah. Cool. Wow. Um, that's amazing. I think it's really evident, like listening to all of you kind of talk about how you got into digital, that you've all done a hell of a lot. Um, so we've had quite a few questions um, from the audience. I think it's um, evident that there's quite a few um, themes kind of going on, people wanting to understand how to get into the digital sector. Um, I want to just throw this one out there because it's been the top voted one. Um, and I'm going to throw it over to you, Jem. But um, what do you think, um, or, or do you think, what do you think um, are the main barriers for people getting into the digital industry? I guess it's fear because frankly we all use digital all the time we mm. pay our bills online we look at our bank accounts online we all post on social media there is you know we're all digital there is no way of getting away from it so i don't necessarily think it's just about reframing you know if you post on social media five times a day i do that it's terrible <laughs> you know go get a job working as, as a community manager or working in social media. You know, I, I do admit, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to start a PhD soon and I'm gonna have to start some data science stuff. I'm gonna look at learning Python and Neo4j. And I am terrified, because, mm. whoa, that's gonna be hard. But you just have to try. If you put yourself out there, if you keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep going for stuff and reframe what you think you, you know is. So there's this stat to do with them um, women applying for jobs, where men, if they see that they get meet 30% of the criteria, they all apply for a job, whereas women generally want like 90% or 100% of criteria, and if they feel like they don't meet that, then they won't apply. Mm. Stuff that, we're just yeah. as good as blokes. Let's, you know, let's start applying for jobs where we only meet 30% of the criteria and reframe what we already know mm. and make that fit that criteria. Just scanning some of the questions, it's quite, <laughs> there's some fantastic questions that have come through, but at least three or four are about Jack sing <laughs> yeah. singing on stage. <laughs> you um, do not want to hear me sing. <laughs> <laughs> but for those I, of you who... Do a synth thing. I, I stood behind a keyboard. <laughs> uh, sometimes I had a microphone, but it wasn't on. Uh, I thought it was on. They played it in my ear, but it, it wasn't on. <laughs> Well, I was about to say they weren't paying attention because you're, you're the synth player, not the lead singer, which is... Um, yeah, you don't want to hear me sing. No, so I'm going to just, for well, your what sake... What was your band called? Will we know them? Uh, one Night Only, we were called. I'm sorry, I don't That's a new... <laughs> 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 there, there's a lot of puns about One Night Only and Just For yeah. Tonight. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'll save you the, uh, the hassle. I've not heard any of them before, so if you want to uh, <laughs> fire away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will ask a, a serious question. Um, fire away. I feel that would be a good idea. Do um, we have to do the serious questions, though? Cause uh, unless you want to sing. <laughs> uh, <okay>. well, <laughs> serious questions it is. At least the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably one for Leanne, maybe. Um, you might have a, an angle on this, but um, one of the questions is, how were you perceived when you started uh, your first job in digital, not coming from a digital background and interviewing uh, and so on? Did, did, did people treat you any differently, or was it hard to navigate the interview process? And I think the biggest barrier is myself, really, just like, Jen was saying, um, is that nag niggling thing of self-doubt just constantly whenever, whenever I'm in the office, whenever I'm doing any piece of work is, uh, should I really be here? Because, you know, I haven't gone through the traditional route. So the biggest sort of thing for me is myself and every day, you know, just trying to get over my, that barrier that I'm imposing on myself. In terms of people treating me uh, differently, some people have, yeah. Some people have just sort of seen me just, you know, just waltzing. Um, like, because it was very quick, to be fair. Um, just waltzing. Um, but what they didn't see was all the work prior. They just think that maybe I just said, hi, can I just have a job? 
Um, but no, it was a lot of work and that's what I try and get across when I speak to people. Like, you can, it can be done, it can be done very fast, but it's a lot of work and you have to be willing to put that work in. Um, but in terms of the other side of it, the tech community in Leeds is fantastic. Um, and people welcomed me, not in spite that I was new to the industry, but because I was new to the industry. And people were so generous with their time. I've, I've never had that in any other sort of um, other professions that I've done before. Um, you know, in like 10 years of being project manager and other things like that. So that's what I would really sort of take away with it is, haters are going to hate, but, you know, just keep your head up. Cool. And I think just to kind of continue on what you were saying about um, sort of other meetups. Um, there's a question here around um, any other sort of meetups or events that you would recommend going to in the digital sector? Um, yeah, so um, if you go in uh, women specific, so just keep coming to these uh, She Does Digital events, uh, Ladies of Code, Empowering Women with Tech, uh, Wild as well, Women in Leeds Digital. Um, but um, also there's just loads of general ones as well. My particular favorite is Code Up, um, which I still go to as regularly as I can. And that's a really friendly environment. They, they just um, teach you, um, it's usually just split over two sessions, so they just teach something to do with um, programming. Um, and you just go to it in a friendly environment with your laptop, you just follow along. It's really wonderful and it always has free pizza. That's one thing I would, be very cautious about if you are going to go for a career in tech that it will affect your waistline <laughs> because you could literally eat pizza every single night of the week for free. Sorry, I was just scanning questions. Um, just one for Lucy, really, because uh, obviously you're not happy to be here. That's fine. Um, <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> well, welcome home. <laughs> but um, the US and the UK in terms of you know the work environment and um, like what, what do you think the main differences are between the US and the UK apart from obviously the amazing jobs in the UK and the US that you've had? Yeah, um, mainly I think it's like I was really, really well looked after at my company in the US. Right. Like they were, we were a very creative agency so it was all about being super creative and being you know very talented but a lot, of, we also had really great systems in place in terms of like how the agency operated so we had you know these like morning meetings every single morning and then um like road mapping where we would plan out our tasks and then tasks were delegated with times attached and it was all very like that whereas like the agency i'd worked with here were much more like oh you're doing this this afternoon and then just send me off to do it whatever and then it, they were also just very accommodating like they, you know, looked after me, sorted my visa and everything, and then allowed me to have time off when I needed. And well, actually, getting time off in the US is really hard, but for me, it was like okay, <laughs> because you know, I was like only there for the year and stuff. And um, yeah, I think there's like crazy opportunities out there, like especially as an international as well. You know, people would pick, pick up on the British accent very quick, and <laughs> it was very easy to strike up a conversation. And just being given an opportunity like that, and specifically being op given an opportunity to grow so much, because I went from an intern to being like in these crazy big meetings in like, you know, s sky rise buildings off Fifth Avenue. And like, I'm just this 21 year old from England who's like, um, they think is the waitress from downstairs or something, but. Um, it just gave me this crazy sense of confidence and that has allowed me to just grow so much more. And I think without them, you know, giving me that, you know, you can do this kind of thing, I wouldn't have got it otherwise. Yeah. I mean, Fifth Ave isn't exactly the head though, is it? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a question for Maddie, I think. Um, so do you find it tricky keeping up with the latest um, tech in digital? Um, I do think there's, there is quite a lot to, to kind of keep on top of. Um, I think what I found working digital is that the majority of people you come across are pretty passionate about what they do. Um, so between you all, if everyone's kind of keeping in the loop of what's going on, you know, attending events, um, there's loads of like online training courses and things you can do that actually between you and knowledge sharing and stuff that it's it's not it's not that difficult in theory. Um, but I do would encourage that 
you, you do kind of try to proactively keep on top of it and kind of look into new stuff. And also just thinking about in terms of like processes or maybe you know tools that you're using in your current job, if there's something new to the market or something someone else recommends something is like trying it out because you're, well, for me anyway, I don't think my, my process will ever be like flawless. So if someone's gonna come to me and say, oh, we've got this new tool and it does this, or have you thought of this? Because actually you can manage projects in this way, then give it a try, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But um, there seems to have been quite a lot of flexibility to try out new things and, and make sure you are always learning. It keeps it interesting and, um, yeah. There's one here, is, do you feel kind of more or less heard in a digital environment related to your previous environment? Um, obviously, a chef environment probably isn't quite the same. I'm def I can shout, <laughs> I still need to shout quite regularly, particularly at events. Um, I don't know, I guess being a woman in tech means that sometimes you can feel overlooked. I have blue hair, it's very hard to overlook me, but actually I think that's kind of a defense mechanism. People pay attention to me. I go to meetings with accountants and lawyers and they're like, Oh, I've never met anyone like you before. Like, damn right you haven't, and now you're going to listen to me. And it's really effective, actually. Um, but I do think we have a problem with, you know, blokes kind of dismissing what, what we say, particularly when we come to, you know, I'm not techie, but I can talk about things quite yeah. technically. But because I'm not techie, they go, well, what would you know? And then I start talking, they go, oh, oh, hang on a minute. But having the confidence to be able to do that is really, really important, and it's quite, you know, practice makes perfect. I wasn't like this... I probably was. <laughs> but, you know, I was a bit shyer at first and a bit more reticent and had imposter syndrome. And, um, yeah, the more you put yourself out there, the, the easier it gets. And probably the same question for Leanne. Anthropology, probably quite a different industry to software engineering. Yeah. Um, so, again, like, like Jen, I've not really ever had trouble with people listening to me, which says a lot, I think. Um, but um, I have come across it, yeah, where... I feel like I've got more to prove when I'm in a, um, a room full of men, really, sometimes. Not every time. Most, most blokes are just lovely, but um, there has been the odd occasion. And it's not nice when I go to, like, conferences and things like that, and I'm the only woman in the room. And I, I even went to one recently, and um, it was a cybersecurity one, so I was really in my element, loved it. Um, and I was going around, and they were just like... I could hear all these sexist comments, not directed at me, but they were just like, oh, well, you know, years ago, you know, we, we had women here, but they were all just serving us drinks and things like that. And, you know, I overheard that, and I was like one of two women there or something like that. Um, and they just assumed I worked in, like, marketing, you know, that they, they weren't talk, wouldn't talk to me on a technical level at all. So even the industry itself... You know, and I could be spending loads of money with them and they don't even want to consider my thoughts and opinions. So there has been a few pushbacks, but I think if we just keep talking about it and keep proving that we can engage in the conversations, then things are going to get better. And that's one of the reasons why um, I am keeping going the code club that I helped set up at NHS Digital to encourage more women um, in the women's network to learn coding skills. Not so that they can all be software developers, but just so they can p participate more in the technical conversations in the teams that they're working in, because we're all cross-functional teams. So I think that will go towards some way as well. Excellent. Um, Jack, um, Hello. congratulations. I believe you're moving on to a new job in the next I couple am, of days. I am, after the bank holiday, yeah. Excellent. So yes. I've got a question for you about um, how do you prep for an interview? If you don't have a lot of knowledge about digital, do you have any advice and tips on that? That's a belter of a question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, I've been a strong believer in being completely open and honest about anything. The, the imposter syndrome thing that you're saying before, I, I still get that now quite a lot. The, there's that feeling of someone's going to call me out one day and say, you actually don't know what you're talking about at all, do you? And, and there are those occasions where you think, oh, well, probably don't know enough about that. But I think there is nothing wrong with saying I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I'll definitely be able to find out the answer and, and, get, and get back to you on that. Um, but I just don't have it right now. And I think even in an interview situation, it's important to sort of embrace that whole sort of thing where it's like, this is where I am now, and this is what I know now. Um, I'm not saying I know everything, um, but 
that's good because I certainly want to get a lot closer to knowing as much as I, I'm not going to say I want to get close to knowing everything. That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I want to get. I want to, you know, build on where I am now and 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 grow my knowledge uh, and and be part of a team and and you know grow with everyone. Um, I think, yeah, that being being open and honest is is really important and sort of embracing that whole thirst for wanting to do more. Uh, and there's another question off the back of that. A number of you have degrees. Um, how important do you think the degree is in, in the whole process? Obviously, not, all. <laughs> not even a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> I, don't have one. I don't even have A levels, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. That answers that question. No, I, th I thought that's what we So. <laughs> I think it's like the stuff that comes along with being at university that's important, like the fashion the beer. Life skills. I got involved. With <laughs> yeah, you get quite a lot of beer on tour as well. Yeah. <laughs> and in agencies, it's, there's beer everywhere. It's very popular. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it is. <laughs> Sorry about me. <laughs> Sorry. Beer is catching on. Oh, okay. Um, so we've got a question for Leanne. Um, does NHS Digital have a good split um, for men, oh, so of, of men and women, I believe? Um, what do you think about the best way to encourage, what do you think is the best way to encourage more women into the public sector? Um, so at NHS Digital, um, the actual employee split is, is almost 50-50. But in terms of technical roles, oh, now you're asking it. Um, I'm currently working on the gender pay gap at NHS Digital, part of the Women's Network. And I believe off the top of my head, there is 13% software developers are women. None of them are in the IT management roles. I can't remember the rest, but it's all very low percentages. We're talking nothing more than 15% in the sort of technical field at NHS Digital, and we're about 2,000 strong staff base um, in a digital company with you know, delivering digital items. Um, so that's not good at all. Um, so in terms of what we're sort of doing about the split, you know, the Women's Network has gone some way, um, especially because um, I've been there about a year now, but the Women's Network has gone a long way even just since I've started. You know, we've really started to take some of these issues really seriously. Um, we've started to do um, a lot more work in schools and universities as well. So getting out there and we're doing a lot of work with the STEMETS program that you may have heard of. Um, and as I say, the Code Club, as well, you know, just getting more women interested in tech internally, which I think is really crucial. Um, you know, we're all here because you're interested in retraining probably for a career. Um, and we tend to neglect that the staff that we've got now also have the skills necessary. You can, you can learn the technical side of it. You know, that's not the big deal. But just imagine all the other skills that you have currently, add a bit of technical knowledge on top of that and you could be fantastic. Um, employees for your company and things like that. So I think we need to also start thinking of what skills do we need now and what does our workforce currently offer? You know, what can we offer them now? Because it's all very well and good saying, you know, that right, we're going to teach loads of kids how to code, but we've got to bring them through that process. We're not going to see the benefits of that for decades. Um, and that's even if they decide to even carry on with a career in tech. But there's that what we found when we did the Code Club was that our staff were really interested in learning how to code. The event sold out within 48 hours, a massive waiting list ensued. Um, literally every time someone cancelled or whatever, within seconds it was booked up again. Um, the feedback was absolutely phenomenal. People were going to say, 70% you know, said they were going to continue their coding journey. The rest said maybe, so I say that's a 100% win. <laughs> um, and you know, they, they can't wait for the next one. They, uh, after the event, I was just getting constantly emails, just like, when is the next one? I want to go. I want to learn how to code. And this is people, you know, um, who've never written a line of code in their life, you know. Um, they've been in the same job for years, and they're just desperate to learn. So I think we are missing a trick by not looking at our own staff as it currently is. I'm just throwing it to either Jack or Maddie around agency as well. What do you feel about the gender split? across the agencies that you work in? I think we can both answer this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, I've noticed the change. I've been, I've been at Parallax sort of, uh, well, six and a half years. I was the only girl. Yeah, yeah. When, when, <laughs> when, Jem, when Jem worked at Parallax, she was the only girl. Um, and how long ago was that now? About six years. Yeah. Um, there, there has been a change in, in terms of certainly people that have been coming for interview. 
and then people that have actually joined joined the agency um, across all different all different roles. Um, and I think personally, I've never understood why there's been this difference in the numbers. Regardless, I think I think there's a lot of sort of stereotypes that come from film and mm. you know other things that, like it, it. It's one of those sort of like preconceptions which is unfounded and silly, really. It's, I think I think that you know the more people keep having these conversations and and as you were saying before about the tech industry being very open and welcoming, actually, um, the more we can actually say to people, actually, if you if you are interested, people will invite you in and. You will have a good time, you know. If you if you've got a thirst for it, you'll you'll do really well. I think the more that message gets out there, the more it will actually start to get back to where it should be. At Thank my um, agent, sorry, <laughs> at my agency in New York, I worked in a team of mostly all women mm. and just a couple of homosexual men. <laughs> so it was great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, our boss was was male, and but we were yeah all women, and a lot of the clients like when we were meeting with them were also women too. So that was really great compared to the experience I had in my agency here in Leeds where I was one of the only two women out of like 10 other people. I was just trying to count up the people in the department I work in at Epiphany. Um, I think there is about 25 of us and there is six women. Um, it, I kind of reflects the huh? it reflects the percentage quite Yeah, well. so it's <laughs> about, about the 20% um, mark. What I would say is that the majority of women that do work at Epiphany um, are in client services or project management team. Um, they tend to be quite women strong, um, which is a shame because um, we used to have a couple of female developers and they were really cool, got on with them really well. Um, but yeah, it tends to be in production that it's mainly men and in account project management it's mainly women. Um, but that's maybe because we can multitask. Um, a few of you mentioned um, meetups and, and uh, kind of events as good resources for learning. Um, but how important, and I think I might know the answer to this, but how important do you think any prior training is to, to going for an interview or a job in digital? Is there any resources that you'd recommend looking at? Um, is there anything apart from just kind of going to an interview and just being honest with people? Uh, is there anything you think you should do as a prerequisite? I think having a passion project. So when I went for my first job as a tech copywriter, I had built a poetry magazine called Indigo Rising and uh, I'd built the website because I needed to do it in WordPress and you know ran the social media even though I didn't know anything about it but I was genuinely passionate about it so I taught myself and then you know we, we had readers from around the world and we had submissions from the US and from Russia and when I talked about that in my interview you know, just the fact that I'd done something like that really demonstrated that I was willing to learn and that I cared and that I was interested in tech and I was interested in digital. I think you can't get a job in tech or digital if you don't care about it. So just find something that interests you in that field. It doesn't have to be, you know, going on Code Academy and learning how to do how to do code if that's not what interests you. But it could just be, you know, work out how WordPress works. It only takes like half a day, to be honest, um, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, there's a lot of free training and resources out there, but if you don't really know where to start, it can be quite difficult to find something that, that will help you. Um, I think showing your drive um, to learn and want to learn is, is a massive thing in that you might not have the skills up front, but if you can show that you're going to come in on day one and you're gonna, you really want to learn and you want to listen to what people have to say and you know, take skills from them, then you know, that's what, what people are looking for. You, you hire the person, really, don't yeah. you? I mean, the, all the skills can be learned. So it's, you know, if, if, if you turn up and you've got the right mindset, then everything else can sort of follow, really. Yeah, absolutely. So a um, couple of questions about kind of moving into the digital industry. Um, one relating to salary. Um, do you have to factor in a drop in salary um, at all when you move into digital? I'm afraid so, <laughs> uh, but only to start with. I've heard it's good. <laughs> um, I, I definitely did because I, I was um, in leadership roles prior, so um, I did have to make the choice to to drop down to a graduate scheme salary. Um, but I just know it's going to improve, so it's just take the grunt for the time being, get all the experience and. Uh, knowledge that I've been gaining. I've had so many great opportunities and I've no doubt that 
I won't be on that forever. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's quite important to say as well on that is that you don't if you don't work in digital now, you don't necessarily have to go in at entry level to get into a role in digital. Mm. You have to think about the skills that you've got in in the job that you're doing now and whether they're transferable to a more senior role. You know, it doesn't mean that obviously in some circumstances, yeah, you do need to go in at entry level, but don't necessarily think that that that's where you have to start. You know, you can can go in at higher level roles as long as you've got the right attributes. Yeah, I think that was one another question about about that. So taking. Um, moving from a senior role in an unrelated sector to a senior role in digital, do you have to take a drop in uh, responsibility? And I think that pretty much answers that question. So, cool. Uh, there's one here. It's kind of tech is always changing, and as a result, and as a result of new jobs um, are constantly being created. What's your advice on navigating a career through tech and through these changes? You're winging it, aren't you? If you don't know what the next job's going to be, you know they say <laughs> that our kids are kids are going to be doing jobs that we literally cannot possibly yeah. comprehend. So just keep up to date. So uh, AI, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is going to fundamentally change how we how we live, how our world runs. And that, you know, it's not going to be tomorrow, but it, it is coming and we can't possibly comprehend. But as long as you're putting yourself out there, you're striving, you're, you're looking about, about what's happening, you know, all your skills are always going to be transferable until Skynet comes and wipes us all out. <laughs> repent, <laughs> repent. <laughs> I guess the thing is you have to keep being reactive to what is changing and tech is tech is reactive. I mean, yeah. you know, we we're, we're all there's something, you know, someone invents something, everyone derides it for a few years and then suddenly everybody's everybody's doing it. You know, smart homes, for example, you know, everyone sort of was a pipe dream since the eighties. VR, you know, we're starting to see I think there's going to be a VR uh, meetup starting soon run by Kane Fulton. You know, that kind of, everyone's been talking about it for a really long time, but suddenly we're actually seeing people, you know, use it and utilise it and interact with it. And, you know, it's going to be amazing. Just keep up with what's happening. I can say on the theme of Skynet, um, one to <laughs> Leanne. Um, do you feel like cyber security is stuck in the past in terms of equal opportunity, inclusion and diversity compared to other digital industries? Yes, uh, I, unfortunately I do. Um, and I've been doing a lot of research into it because I, I think that's where I'm going to sort of end up. Um, and yeah, I, it looks like it's going to be a bit of a tough nut to crack that one. Um, but I think the only person, like I keep saying, is the only person that's holding you back is yourself. So you just need to just pull your chin up and just say, like, I deserve to be here because of I've put the effort in, I've put the hours in, I've put the training in, I've every right to be here just, just as you, you do as well. Um, but yes, there is a lot of um, things that need to tackle. I, I'm not sure why in particular cybersecurity is a, uh, is, is a bit more of a boys club than any other sort of industry, but it, it really is. And uh, I think maybe a lot of it has to do with, if you ever speak to anyone in cybersecurity, they'll either come from like two backgrounds and one of them tends to always be the army. So I don't know if that's that kind of sort of ingrainedness as well. Um, and that sort of culture sort of brings it forward and attracts people into the industry as well. Um, but I'm going to try, I'm going to uh, uh, pull up my boots and uh, kick down some doors, I think. Uh, there's one here about kind of what, what do you think the biggest differences are uh, in the digital industry compared to the other industries that you've worked in? Obviously, amazing officers in, in you know, obviously, Maddie, you said that the cool officers was one of the things that attracts you initially, and maybe there's uh, there's some nice things that um, remote working, flexible working are, are a lot more common in the digital sector. Um, kind of, what do you think the main differences are, and, wh and what do you like about those differences? I think it's passion. Like most people you speak to in creative or digital industries love what they do and it, not only do they do it in their job in every day they do it for themselves like outside of work in passion projects and other bits and it makes it, it just makes all the difference because when you meet someone else in the industry you're like oh yeah and then you go into like a little geek mode or something because y you you get it i don't know it's just like i think it is that love for what you do i think that's how meetups start and how little yeah. kind of you know pub chats turn into more formal kind of meetings and stuff Um, so we've got a couple more questions to go. Um, does anyone know of any companies in Leeds that are particularly open to people, so people that are changing careers, so career changes? Skybet are amazing, yeah. I think. If, you know, if you're really interested in a digital uh, career, 
than they do for the day that you went to. But I think if you've got uh, the, the NHS Digital, sorry, I'm feeling like I'm talking for you now. <laughs> How rude of me. No, I'm mansplaining. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, but I, 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 you don't have to start in a big company. A lot of li little companies are, are really happy to take you. You know, it might be that there's a firm that's doing something that isn't digital that needs some help with their social media. And that can be a really key way of getting in. You know, it might be a shop and you might be talking to the owner and they might go, oh, and I really want to do a Twitter account, but I'm not really sure how I'm doing it. Like, if you were on Twitter every day, then just go, I can help you with that. And yes, yeah, start there. You don't, you know, there's, there's loads of different ways in. You just have to be creative. Definitely, and um, FDM is one as well. They've got a really good uh, uh, career uh, returns and career changes program as well. And just sort of echoing that, LinkedIn is a massively useful resource. Um, get yourself out there. Post now. Get out your phones now. Post that you've come to this and say, you know, you have come to this, you know, that you're interested. If you're really serious about career and tech, let people know. I'm very vocal, because um, I've spent like the last 10 years, you know, I loved all, all the work I was doing, but I, s I got to a ceiling point, and text allowed me to get to a different point because I'm more vocal, I've said what I wanted to do. There is no one that ever comes across me and doesn't know exactly what my five, 10 year plan is. Um, I tell them within the first two minutes. Mm -hmm. You need to be vocal, you need to let people know you want to be in this industry. So get on LinkedIn, it's a fantastic resource. Post wherever you're going. Find an interesting article, share it, and say you know what your thoughts and opinions are about it. It's a great resource, and I constantly get messages all the time saying, "Oh, you know, I've, I've seen you, you constantly come up in my feed. You know, I'd like to speak to you about X, Y, and Z. You know, um, can you do a talk for me?" And I've had so many opportunities from there, just just by just posting and just being active on there. It's been really fantastic. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go to places and people are like, "Oh, I know you from LinkedIn," and that's where you want to be because you want people to remember you especially early on in your career. So it's a really great resource. I linked in all the way. I think we're both reading the same question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a really interesting question about um, disparity in numbers due to variance in interest in the digital environment between genders and how can the interest uh, be increased? Um, so one of the examples is the percentage of um, applicants for this particular example is 95% male. So what can we do about that and how can we? I, I also read a piece on what you said about women only going for jobs when they meet a certain number of criteria compared to men. And I think it is just teaching people that, yeah, you can do that actually. And like, it, I don't, I, I mean, I personally would always just apply no matter how much criteria I met. <laughs> if I wanted that job, I'm, I'm gonna try. I think we need to take but a leaf out of your yeah. book, to be honest. Yeah, it's definitely just like gi giving women more confidence to be able to go for these opportunities. I actually think that the onus is on the companies that are writing the job descriptions, though. I read yeah. another piece yeah. which was talking about the way that Google and Amazon word their job descriptions in comparison to Slack. So they're all about ambition and drive and this is Google. Whereas Slack talk about you know collaboration and community and that's what we need to change. We need to stop thinking that you need to like be, everything's gonna be brilliant, I'm gonna be the CEO <laughs> by next year. Like, Cause you're not. And you know, with jobs, when jobs descriptions are written and when companies are creating jobs, there needs to be a culture of, of learning. So I was here, um, about a month ago with Hark, who are an environmental IoT company. And it was really fabulous um, interviewing um, the CEO because one of the things that he said was that when they employ mid and senior people, they ensure that 30% of their time is dedicated to training up those below them. And that, for me, is a culture which should be in every single company. And it's not, you know, I think a lot of companies expect us to get trained up on our previous job and we work yeah. our way up by swapping jobs. Why? Isn't it better to train up actually while you're in the job? Mm -hmm. And if we're employing people, you know, seniors to mentor, then every, you know, everyone's going to have a better time and we're going to create a culture where, you know, everybody's learning and we can learn these skills, not just tech skills, but soft skills. That's how I think it should be done. I was um, reading, I can't remember what, where I read it or who said it, but it was about teaching your employees to be vulnerable and be comfortable being vulnerable and bringing, kind of hiring the person, but letting them also, you know, be vocal about when they don't know something, they want to learn something, um, instead of being like, if you don't know this, then you're not, you're not the right fit. That's, that's not the right attitude, is it? 
I think there was also a question about um, job adverts often include skills which we more than one person and look like essentially a wish list um, rather than a role. I think your point about actually, and you know, your point as well about companies actually looking at how they write job descriptions. I think most people will take a template that they found on Google or they'll take you know, the previous template which they may have written like maybe a couple of years ago. So I think that's a really good point about actually let's you know, talk about how we use language and how we put our job descriptions out there because I think that is a very valid point that, you know, we end up writing this massive bullet pointed list of all these things that, you know, people need to do. Um, when, you know, your point, Jack, about being, bra uh, being honest and just being like, you know, this is who I am, I'm really keen, I'm really enthusiastic, I want to grow my skills, um, I think, you know. You don't have to change the language particularly much though like it's yeah, it's, it's, it's very subtle. very slight differences and i i know i've seen I, th I think a lot of the job descriptions that work really well are the things it's like you 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 need to be able to do these things mm. it would be good if you could do some of these yeah. things and you can expect to gain these things you know and you sort of think all right well i can get into that first bit so it's definitely the right page to be on <laughs> and then and then the rest sort of like you think all right well we can talk about that and that, that I think that sort of like threshold, yeah. that threshold that people give themselves, yeah. where they think, oh, I could apply for that. People just need a thesaurus when they're writing a job <laughs> description, <laughs> essentially, yeah. and make sure that you're using the right word. I'm a writer. The right word <laughs> is important. The, th the interesting thing about that format of um, job spec, though, is that it, it cues you up for the interview. So, you know, there's the stuff that you're definitely going to talk about and you can feel comfortable talking about, and then it kind of goes off piece from there, and that's quite nice, I think. It, it's, it is that sort of... As we were saying before, that you know, that, that there are some things that you do need, like for certain roles yeah. and for certain things, and that I think that, that it's important to be sort of honest about those bits. But the rest can all sort of fall into place behind it. Um, there's a nice question, Richard. How did you decide um, you were ready to take the leap from your old job into the digital sector? Obviously, some of your um, leaps have been more organic evolutions, so it's not quite um, a, as heavy as that, but. How did you decide that it was the right thing to do? I know you, no one ever knows what the right thing yeah, is to no do. No one wakes up in the morning and goes, right, today I'm going to yeah. do this. Or maybe some people do. I don't know I, anyone. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I guess it's a general question, really. H how did you know that it felt like the right move at the time? I can't bring about the future that Star Trek promises <laughs> if I don't work in tech. <laughs> so it was a pretty easy decision for me. Fair. So Star Trek, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Redundancy is a really great <laughs> career. <laughs> <laughs> Guess that's quite a key driver, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> uh, the the guys sort of they sort of spent a little bit of time convincing me that I was right to do it uh, with with the digital side of things um, because of qualities that they saw in me. Um, you know that sort of you know an interest, but also wanting to take things to bits and figure out how they work and knowing what the end goal is so you know if something isn't the way that it should be and that's all you kind of need to start testing and playing around with tech because it's either right or it isn't for certain things like if a contact form doesn't send the form it's yeah. not working <laughs> you, you can you can figure that out quite quickly and then you start to learn how the bits underneath make that work and you just keep applying that to bigger and bigger things and you learn more and more but you know, you, you started off at that role, and then you know, six and a half years later, you become a core part of the business. And I guess that's that's the hire the person thing again. Really, that seems to be a theme. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think as long as you're as long as you're hungry for it, and you're not you don't allow yourself to start coasting in it, um, and keep asking for more. You yeah. know, if you if you want more, then you need to sort of say, I'm ready. I'm ready for you to give me another challenge, or I want to take this bit on. I think if you if you feel brave enough to have those conversations and want to go get it, then yeah, it's all there for the taking, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, I think we're starting to really kind of wrap up. Um, just got a couple of questions, and it'd be good for maybe a few of you to answer this one. Um, but if you could go back and take your journey into digital again, is there anything that you would change um, or do differently? I guess with hindsight being the... I would take the money that I would spend on uni and spend it on camera equipment and travel the world and do super cool work instead of going to school. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more about the experiences that you gain than it is like what you learn in school because 
like it when you're in a job in digital you're not really putting anything into practice that you that you learn at university really obviously that it's a, like to some it's an important part of the process but really it's about just getting in early getting that work experience in the beginning and letting it lead to those bigger opportunities did you have any other questions off that in the mind or was that the last i think it's quite a nice closer <laughs> has anyone else got anything to add to that one what would you do again has anyone got any advice i think there are a couple obviously um career changes or people that are thinking of getting into the industry does anyone have sort of just to end on some advice to kind of finish us off i guess just keep trying you know if you get a job in digital and it's not the right one it might not be that that job isn't for you it might be that place isn't for you or those people aren't for you but just keep trying and that way you know it might be that you start and you, you do social media and you actually know i want to do copywriting or i want to do coding but if you try you know failure doesn't really exist to be honest it's just you know you know my my stupid co-working business it's failed and I could be like oh that's rubbish but honestly I wouldn't be doing this job now if I hadn't have done that yeah. by putting myself out there and by trying something new I've ended up somewhere completely different but that's actually absolutely brilliant so just do that just keep keep striving this is one for everyone so and you all have to answer I'm afraid what is the best and worst bit of your <laughs> I did lock a guy up earlier and I <laughs> I think it might be backfiring on me it's right holding, now. It's holding just for yeah. now. <laughs> I'll, we'll sort it's it out. It's getting really so. angry now. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the worst part of my day. Um, but <laughs> what's the best and worst part of your day? And be honest. So if A you're typical day, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the best part of my day is when I go out and I meet like a founder of a business and he tells me about an idea in tech which I would never have thought of and it's absolutely amazing. And then not only that, but I can help him, whether it's putting him on one of our programs or putting him in touch with somebody. The worst part of my day is a freaking program called Airtable where I have to put in data <laughs> and it's <laughs> awful and it doesn't look up properly <laughs> and I hate it. Don't use that table. <laughs> yeah. um, best part of a day is it's, it, it's both. We're, we're quite what I do is quite people facing on both sides of the coin. So the best part of things is where you where you win something that's really good, or someone gets some really really good feedback, and everyone's feeling really positive about a project because um, you all sort of ride that wave together, and you know it, it, you, it's it's a big sort of team mentality and. It's just it's just a really good feeling when you launch something and it's gone really well and people are really enjoying what you do. Like people in the world are using it. Yeah. And we're just in a room in Leeds. You know, it's quite it's quite an empowering thing. It feels really good. Um, the worst part of the day is breaking bad news to people. On again on both sides of the coin. You know, if it, you end up being a middleman, and so if someone's not happy for one reason or another, you need to go to the other side and say. No, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do this different way, um, and you uh, you have to assume that responsibility every time, and that it's a bit of a it's a bit of a personal burden because you don't like being that person. Sometimes a lot of people say if you see one of us sauntering over in the middle of the afternoon, not looking particularly jolly, then everyone sort of goes under the table a bit. <laughs> um, but you know, I think the again on the sort of good side of things if you can make the best out of those situations and make it a win-win for everyone then that's that's a really good feeling okay um so worst part is probably when i'm sat pair programming with someone and they go do you understand what i'm showing you nah mm. uh oh, okay well, let me explain it do you understand nah, nah. <laughs> and it's just that sort of Constantly, little sinking feeling where I just you know again you sort of the doubts seep in and you think uh, should I be, should I be here? But you know I am learning. I have to keep telling myself I am learning. So that's the worst part. Uh, the best part though is is after I've done the paired program, I come back to my desk and I open my emails, uh, and there's a lovely email that says, "Hi Leanne, I saw you at a talk last night, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to." teach myself how to code. I'm, I've been doing the same job for five years. I absolutely hate it. I'm going to get into tech. And that's the best part. Um, I would say the worst part is like disheartening client feedback when they're either 
pushing for a strict deadline that is just like absolutely incomprehensible or they don't quite like what you've done or something. But the best part is when the project comes to a completion and you and your coworkers are all like bigging each other up and you're like, yeah, this was so good. And it's out there for people to see. Um, I would say the worst part of my day is um, fires on a website. Um, so when you work in web development, websites break and go down. And it's not it's not fun to deal with. Um, but the best part is is learning new stuff. I mean, I definitely learn at least something new every day. Um, and like I said, everyone is so keen to help other people learn that you know they'll spend five minutes sitting down and talking you through it. For example, today I learned about a very complicated release process and one of my clients, which I kind of understand, but you know we're getting there. Cool. I think that's a wrap. So um, just want to say a huge thank you um, to all our speakers. You've been amazing. Um, thank you so much for giving up your time um, for, pre um, for prepping for this event. A huge thank you to um, everyone out there who submitted questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get time to answer yours. Um, and yeah, thanks to Josh and Hey, it's been a pleasure. Thanks to Sheila. <laughs> um, we'll be hanging around um, for some drinks and some networking. So if anyone wants to come and have a chat to any of our speakers um, or to myself and Josh, and please come and say hi. Um, we'd love to have a chat with you. And let's get to the bar because it's been a while since we've all had a drink. <laughs> so yeah, huge thank you again. I hope you've got something um, out of today and it's inspired you to make that career change. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.